Now, this week's music edition of Third Ear. It's introduced by Michael Hall. In recent years, no one has done more to promote and perform the music of those who contributed to the renaissance of British music in the first half of this century than Vernon Handley. He's conducted and made gramophone records not only of music by the famous names, Elgar, Vaughan Williams, Bax, Holst, but also the relatively obscure, Cyril Rutum, John Foles, Joseph Holbrook. Last month, he celebrated his 60th birthday, an age, Vernon Hadley, when the career of a conductor begins to take off and reach its zenith. Well, um, yes, it used to. Uh, I'm a little bit worried about it because nowadays they all seem to get um, to the peak around 28 or 29. So I'm uh, lagging behind a bit, but I can't expect anything else uh, considering the repertoire I've chosen and the style of conducting that I've chosen. But it is true that, in fact, the, the conductors sort of do mature, as it were, <laughs> after their 60s. What I, what I really, uh, why I brought that question up was because, of course, in this country it's particularly difficult for a conductor to get started. So really one's only in one's career when one's in one's late 50s or 60s. Well, I suppose so, yes. Um, that, once again, I, I think I disagree with you a bit, Michael, because nowadays we do have a number of young conductors in Great Britain who have started in their 20s and uh, gained considerable popularity and some very nice appointments um, in their 30s. But I still, uh, in another way, I agree with you because I don't really feel that I matured at all as a conductor until I got well into my 40s. And I'm now enjoying uh, the processes that are taking place in my interpretations um, more than than in those days. I suppose really it's because of the amount of repertoire one was trying to get through. It's easier to be a conductor in Great Britain now. In those days it was very, very difficult. And when I came down from Oxford, you went and offered yourself to um, managements and they said, go away and get some experience, because there weren't conducting competitions or associate conductorships as there are now. Yes, there are very many more opportunities now. Yes. There are more opera houses, aren't there? I mean, even mm. though not, not many opera houses, but at least you can you know, learn things from Scottish opera or yes. Opera North or whatever. Yes, that's right. Uh, there were no chances of, of that sort. Fortunately, there was, of course, as there has always been in, in our country, um, tremendous amateur chances where you really do have to help lame dogs over styles. Um, so you have to know your business. This, of course, is the great training ground, isn't it, in this country, the Amateur Orchestra and Choral Society? Well, I believe it is. Um, I agree with a couple of uh, other conductors who feel that every conductor, regardless of what instruments he's played, ought to have sung in a choir. He ought to have to make the sounds with his body, because singing, to me, is still the most difficult of all of musical utterances, uh, even more difficult than conducting. So I'm very grateful for those years, even though they were bitterly frustrating in some ways. But you came to music a very unorthodox route, uh, you didn't have a sort of a standard training. You didn't go to the academy or the college. You didn't read music at the university. No, that's right. I was um, seized by music when I was about eight. I heard um, a work you will know, a motet by Holst, This Have I Done For My True Love. But at eight, what it meant to me, because I was in a working-class household, was that I just simply wanted to know what this magic was and get hold of it. My mother taught piano, but she felt I was unteachable. She was quite right. So I taught myself. Um, there, were, there was music in the house and there were musical books in the house so I just got on with it and taught myself. By 12 I was teaching myself harmony and doing quite well and just a little later than that I saw my first orchestral score and wondered why it was sounding wrong in my head simply because nobody had told me about transposing instruments and I had to um, write out on scores that I could get the notes that I should be hearing. Your mother didn't teach you the piano, but did you learn other instruments? No, I didn't. I, I um, had a terrible uh, damage to both my hands in that very same year, when I was eight, which made me, through my teens, a very bitter person because I, my hands were literally too weak to attempt any instrument at all. But I realised, as I got to the end of my teens, that it was almost a godsend because it meant that I had to hear my music through my eyes. and. Uh, that, in a way, although I'd never thought of conducting then, incidentally, not until I was 15 did I have a, a, an inkling that I'd like to conduct, um, it meant that I, it was almost an ideal preparation for a conductor, sit in the armchair and have to create his sounds. And then at 15, because I'd been looking uh, at concert, going to concerts towards the end of the war and seeing this strange gyrating that these people did in front of the orchestra, and when people say to me now, oh, when you're a conductor, people don't actually watch you in the orchestra, do they? I understand what they mean, because that was exactly what I felt at that time. 
Each conductor looked very different, but all of them were emoting in front of an orchestra, and I wondered what they had to do with the sounds that were coming out. And then my marvellous music master at school, who fed me with books and uh, the right sort of ideas, sent me to Maida Vale on a rehearsal pass for the BBC Symphony Orchestra. And I went through the door, the rehearsal had started, I crept in, and there was this, what seemed to me then, an old man, sitting on a stool, moving very little, but with a very long stick, and yet everything he did, with either hand or the stick, or even an inclination of the head, made a different sound come out of the orchestra. And this is Bolt, of course. This is Bolt. And I suddenly knew, that's how it's done. Uh, so now I, I had to study him. Now, I happen to know that Bolt was your mentor, or that you were mm -hmm. Bolt's protégé. How much did you have pri lessons from Bolt, for example? No, uh, eventually, when I came down from Oxford, because I'd written to him from Oxford, and asked whether he'd give me lessons. And he wrote back and said no, and he didn't give lessons because he hadn't got an instrument for a student to practice on, uh, which was a charming way of putting it, and also telling me that there were no chances for young English musicians. So really, he said, uh, forget about it. Keep it as a hobby. Um, I didn't take any notice of that. But then when I came down from Oxford, he was doing a, a Holst concert in 56, and I telephoned his secretary and said, could I please come to the rehearsals because I love Holst's music so much, and there were pieces being done that I'd never heard. And she said, you're not, not the Handley that wrote to us from Oxford. And I said, yes. And she said, well, I will get back to you. And she rang me back and said, yes, you can come to the rehearsals. Sir Adrian's delighted you're interested in Holst. And would you like to come and talk to him about conducting? And I went along to him, and uh, he gave me two hours of the hardest musical grilling that I shall ever go through in my life. He threw everything at me, harmony and counterpoint and so on, very sympathetically, and eventually put a stick in my hand, which made me very nervous, seized a score from his um, bookcase, put it in front of me and said, how would you deal with that? And I started to beat, and I don't think I beat more than two beats. And he said, would you do that again? And I did the two beats again, and he took the stick from the pointed end out of my hand, turned to his secretary and said, I think we'll help this one. Where did you learn to hold a stick like that? And I said, watching you. And he realised that um, I had seen something I, I didn't really fully understand then in my early 20s. What he later said to me was the moral position of a conductor. What did he mean by that? Well, that, that it is morally wrong for a conductor to stand in front of an orchestra and before an audience and show himself off when he ought to be showing the music off. Um, he was very kind to me because, of course, my attraction to conducting was what so many people's attraction to conducting is, this sense of power and, and uh, I suppose, wanting to show off a bit. But then I realised that that has nothing to do with conducting at all. And he realised that I'd realised it. Now, you'd picked up uh, Bolt's technique, but you, yeah. presumably intuitively, had you practised with the, the battle before? Yes, and by then, of course, I'd conducted at Oxford, and I'd conducted when I was in the forces, and I'd conducted amateur choirs and uh, amateur orchestras. And I'd realised, of course, this other great thing, that it works. Could you explain what uh, Bolt's technique embodies them? Yes. It's that the stick moves from the fingers in a way that no other part of the body does move. If you look at many conductors, if you took the stick out of their hands, their arm and wrist and hand would be moving in such a way that an orchestra could still follow them. If you took the stick out of Bolt's hand, the fingers would just be moving in a way that would suggest nothing to the orchestra at all. Put the stick back in the fingers, and everybody is concentrated on the point of the stick. And of course, many conductors used it. it it's not entirely gone. Rostezvensky uses a long stick, uh, propelled by the wrist and often by the fingers, in such a way, of course, that all orchestras can understand him. They say that he doesn't like rehearsing much, that's perfectly true, because he gets his results very, very quickly and has orchestras on the edge of their chairs. But, of course, you and I know many conductors indeed, going back through Kempe, Kletsky, um, Kubilik, Schmittischestedt, who used a lovely wrist technique, occasionally embodying the fingers as well. And not, they, always, with a, not always with a long stick, No, they, sometimes a short stick. That's right, they used a short stick. Bolt um, had the view that the stick really ought to have some sort of proportion to your arm's length and hand's length. Now, his was a very, very long stick. He left me his sticks when he died, which was a lovely uh, um, gesture. But in actual fact, I can't use them because they're like a flagpole in my small hand. I still use a long stick, but it's nowhere near as long as, as bolts. 
Now, what really are the qualities that a conductor must have? Not just technique. I mean, conduct technique is very important. It's this concentration of vision, isn't it, that's so important? That's right. And I, uh, we started talking about technique, and I don't believe that there's any other way that we could find our way into the subject except by calling it technique. But, of course, when you said technique then and asking for the other things that a conductor needs, um, we've rather maligned the word technique in Bolt's sense. Bolt felt that it wasn't just a mechanical thing, that your technique actually got the results. If you had the imagination and the vision that you speak of, you put it down the stick. Um, so many conductors who in fact show the emotions in their body movement and the amount of movement they make with their arms, term technique as being the mechanical time-beating part of conducting. Bolt's technique did not mean that. Of course, he could be very clear when he wanted to be, but there are many musicians still alive who would say he was very vague. He got people to concentrate, and your word vision, I think, is absolutely right. What a conductor needs is a great inner ear, and he must know, really, the general shape of the work. That's to say, many people, he used to say to me, uh, for instance, is a, a nice uh, little story which illustrates it, I see that you're doing a work of Arthur Bliss's. And I said, yes, magnificent. He said, you are going to do it yourself, aren't you? And I said, yes, yes, of course I am. He said, oh, well, sometimes they ask Arthur to do it. And he's a wonderful musician and a great composer, but if he conducts, the climax arrives in the first bar. <laughs> and Bolt, of course, knew exactly where the climax arrives. Now, many modern conductors to me, although wonderfully gifted people, and I'm not denying that, nevertheless don't seem to have the command of the architecture of a piece of music that Bolt and Kubelik and Schmidt-Ischerset had. They seemed to know where to place the one great fortissimo in the work. And Bolt would, would um, he'd be very hard on me, and I'm glad that he did uh, this sort of thing. He came and heard me do um, the rehearsal of the Fifth Symphony of Beethoven first movement once. And in the orchestral break, I said to him, how do you think it went, Maestro? Marvellous, he said. Terrific. What intensity. What fire. My word, you didn't let up for a moment. Tell me, what are you going to do at the concert? <laughs> that was the best lesson I could possibly have, that in Beethoven V first movement, you do not rehearse anything like the fire you're going to produce in the show. But I've heard, uh, even recently, world-famous conductors get their very best performances at the last rehearsal. It is true, yes. But now, what about rehearsal? Because I know that you've got a thing about the amount of rehearsal time that conductors are allowed in this day and age. Mm -hmm. Not very much. Not very much, no. I personally don't mind. I've been brought up uh, to get my results without talking. That's to say, to get my results through my technique. And by technique now, not just the mechanical time beating, as, as I've just explained, but conveying in some way the shape of what I want, the balance of what I want who is important in the orchestra at any given time without talking about it. And I find that when I go to countries where I've got a lot of rehearsal time, uh, they find that I pressure them in, in a way that they're not used. They're used to building things up terribly slowly, but sometimes, of course, um, losing some volition on the way. And I suppose it's just that we grow up here used to British players who are the fastest in the world. Not only the fastest reading, but the fastest to understand what you want. But uh, ancillary to this, there are two conductors in the world at the moment, perhaps two of the very greatest conductors, Gunter Wandt and Celle Vidake, yes. who are tremendously demanding in the amount of rehearsal time they need. And yes. they're outstanding. Yes. Uh, Wandt, of course, does build things up very, very slowly, and his background is to do that and so he finds it perfectly natural to do it. Celebadaki, now, I'm not quite sure myself that this is a great conductor. I think it's a great trainer and a great concentrator on music, but I was um, at uh, at least two of his series of rehearsals in London, one in, in Brahms and one in Sibelius, where uh, uh, at the first readings, wonderful things happened with the LSO, and gradually deterioration set in until we found that he arrived at the concert, which I found very, very mundane indeed. Now, when he worked with the Swedish Radio Symphony Orchestra, he trained them superbly, and they were a, a very disciplined orchestra for many, many years, and still are, fortunately, because of their modern uh, conductors. But they used to tell me when I conducted them that they did many, many very bad performances with him. This is an extraordinary thing. Um, his view of conducting is very, very different, I think, from the performing artist's view. He is a, a thinker about 
conducting and the philosophy of conducting and the philosophy of, mu of music. That doesn't necessarily produce a, a lovely spontaneous result. He's a good teacher, of course. A he? wonderful teacher, yeah. yes. Superb. Can I turn now to the repertoire that you've specialised in? Mm. I don't know what mm. to call this repertoire. I uh, suppose it's the English pastoral tradition, is it? Or um, the English Renaissance or what? Well, Can you define yeah. it? Well, I haven't actually specialised in it. I've been pushed into it because uh, some of its chief protagonists I have worked to, um, uh, you know, to popularise in a way. I think the fact is that all British music um, from Purcell to the present day fascinates me. And although it's not what I'm uh, known for via my records, for many, many years when I was in the wilderness of conducting, I was doing a great deal of British contemporary music, composers um, who are not uh, associated with me now. But unfortunately, I've had a number of records of Vaughan Williams and Elgar and Delius and Bax and Holst and so on, and the unfamiliar people that you mentioned. And so it looks rather as if the first 50 years of this century is, is my happy hunting ground. But um, I was taught by Bolt that you do well what, whatever's put in front of you. And when I've had the happy uh, um, opportunities to be a musical director or chief conductor, of course, British music, although it's been represented, has not been taken the lion's share of my programmes. I do Prokofiev and Stravinsky and Mozart and Beethoven and Brahms as well. And when I travel abroad, most of my programmes will, will contain a British work, but are, of course, of the great world repertoire. But you've just had two birthday concerts with the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic yes. Orchestra. You're the chief guest conductor there. Yes. And they're both very much in that uh, English pastoral tradition. I find them very fascinating programmes. Yes. Um, yes. The first one was two Ravel pieces. And, of course, Vaughan Williams was yes. a pupil of Ravel. Yes. And Howells has very rarely heard Hymnus Paradisi. Right. Um, to a full house, incidentally. Uh, now, I can think that um, in many places... Himmler's Paradisi would still be reckoned by managements to empty the house. So it's a great tribute uh, to the way things are done in Liverpool, and incidentally the way things are, are being done now in, in Birmingham as well, by Simon Rattle, that such wide-ranging programmes can draw big audiences. But you've also done a, or you did a very rare piece of Vaughan Williams, which was the Partita for Stone oh, yes. Orchestra, yeah. which is not often, and I can't remember it being done for years and years and years. No, it, it doesn't get done in concerts much. There are a few records of it, um, because people doing whole symphony cycles, as I am at the moment with, with Liverpool, um, have felt that the fill-ups ought to include that Partita. To me, it is um, the greatest Vaughan Williams string work. I think that it is a, um, a finer, tighter composition than Talis and with very, very many more moods than Talis, and with greater economy than the than One the of the movements, of course, is a memoriam, or an intermezzo for, for Henry, Henry Hall. Hall. Yes, yes, where, where the whole, um, the, the two orchestras are either placing the pizzicato for a foxtrot, or um, the uh, violas in the first orchestra are imitating saxophones. Yes, it's a, a, a magnificent thing which... Uh, anticipates, I think, Peter Maxwell Davis's Foxtrots by um, 30 or 40 years. It's a wonderful work. It is uh, not done, I think, because it's terribly difficult. The scherzo is just on the edge of unplayability, but the Liverpool players have taken it to their hearts, and I'm looking forward to recording it with them. Now, the second programme also had Vaughan Williams in it, the yeah. third symphony, the Pastoral Symphony. So Vaughan Williams, obviously, is the sort of the centre of your Renaissance repertoire, as it were. Yes, I would say Vaughan Williams and Elgar, and if I had my way, um, Bax and Delius, who represent a different uh, sort of, of ethos. Uh, I personally believe that the one composer who is most neglected, most misunderstood about the whole of the, the first half of the century in Great Britain is Bax, and I have uh, a feeling for Bax, which I indulge whenever I can, usually, incidentally, abroad where orchestras let me play backs in the way that uh, orchestras in Great Britain uh, don't let me. Uh, and always, when, when I do it abroad, the players are overwhelmed by the writing. I remember I did the Third Symphony in Sweden, and the principal horn came up to me afterwards and said, we understand that he wrote six other symphonies. When are you going to bring them? I can't imagine uh, what, what his um, manager said when he put that point to me, but I'm quite sure it would frighten any management in England, even the most uh, enterprising. And yet you didn't include Bax and these two birthday programmes? No, I think that uh, I have a certain number of concerts as chief guest, and what we're trying to do is to see that the, the Vaughan Williams symphonies 
and the works that we do on the, the, on the records as fill-ups for the symphonies are all covered in concert programs. Of course, as you know, I do a number of, of records where we don't get the chance to program the works. I've just done a, a record with the Royal Philharmonic of Bantock pieces. Well, of course, if you ask the management, even the most enterprising, to put some Bantock on a program nowadays, they would uh, go white. The uh, very fact you've written, you've done a gramophone record, means that there's a sale for those that kind of music. Yes, there is. There is interest in that music, though probably not the amount of interest to um, spout a concert audience. And of course, these wonderful record companies that we have in Great Britain, who will take a chance and do such things, hoping to get a fine result and therefore to hold the uh, record in their catalogues for years, uh, is something that's very encouraging for those people like myself who believe in the work. It's just on the, the Hebridean Symphony of Bantock. And the RPO, of course, had never seen the work. Um, by the end of the morning, the first morning, they knew it and were playing it superbly and saying, you know, if we're going to play the Richard Strauss tone poems, why don't we play this? Yes, but you did include the, the last work in your um, second concert, not Bantock, but Elgar's Organ Sonata, yes. orchestrated by Gordon Jacob. What an yes. extraordinary choice. Well, you know, we recorded that um, ah. some time back. And the great thing about uh, um, using it in a concert program was that it gave me the chance to do a first public performance of an Elgar work. Because that um, organ sonata, which Gordon Jacob orchestrated superbly, when we first rehearsed it with the orchestra, nobody sp spoke of Gordon Jacob. They just spoke of Elgar, as if he had uh, done it himself, orchestrated it himself. Um, it, it's... Uh, really had only been done once, actually, in a broadcast, by Bolt, I think, in about 1947, or something like that. But it had never been done in public, so we thought that, uh, as we uh, had recorded it, it would be rather nice to present it to the public in Liverpool um, in a public performance. Now, you've done a great deal of this repertoire, the repertoire of the generation of composers who, what, were born in the last century, really, weren't yes. they? And I know that you are interested in British contemporary music, but you've done very little in the concert hall to promote sort of Maxwell Davis and Bert Russell and what have you. Do you know, I, I'm not asked to do it. This is this dreadful pigeonholing that happens to us conductors, and especially if it's British music, the amount of British music that's done in Britain is still not uh, very great when you compare it to, the, shall we say, the amount of Swedish music done in Sweden or Finnish music done in Finland or German music done in Germany. Um, and so I just haven't been asked. I get to, I get asked to do Tippet, and I occasionally, of course, well, I say occasionally, every year I'm doing first performances by some uh, contemporary British composers. I do um, a Howard Blake next year. I've done um, a Harvey this year. Uh, I would like to do more. For instance, when, when you mentioned Bert Whistle, I'm aching to do The Triumph of Time, which I uh, consider a masterpiece. And it's just that the um, amount of British music that I'm asked to do by orchestral managements usually has to be British music that they think will get an audience. That especially applies to London, of course. Of course, it, yes, it, you're suggesting, of course, that the orchestral managements have, are really the sort of the artistic directors of our orchestral society, as it were. I think until you, and I'm not blaming them entirely for this, they're in a, a situation now which is not of their own making, it was of the making of orchestral managements before them. Um, I think that they feel that they have got to please a public in some way. Now, this, this, the, there are two situations here, the one in London and the one outside London. Um, in Liverpool, in Birmingham, these orchestras serve a community, and the community has trusted their managements. And, for instance, the, the, um, the concert that I, I did of, of Howells and Vaughan Williams and Ravel, I don't think could have been put on in a festival hall without emptying the festival hall, unless, of course, it had been conducted by Bernstein or someone like that, then a few people would have come for the name of the conductor. But of course when you get name conductors who've built up their reputation on the world repertoire, not on British music, they're very unlikely to do a British concert. It's the commercial world that really is, is against our musical culture. In yes, sense. yes, and against our managements. I'm sure that the managements in London would like to do very, very much more enterprising programmes, but they really know that in London they may not have an audience for them. In Liverpool we shall have an audience. In Birmingham we shall get an audience. The Halle will get an audience for s some strange programmes now and then. In Bournemouth there are some very, very fine planning of programmes. I was able to premiere the, the Robert Simpson Ninth Symphony in Bournemouth to a full house. 
That so is a very, very encouraging, yes, isn't it? Yes, it is, yes. So th there's another composer we haven't mentioned, incidentally, a living contemporary English composer who I've always believed in and have conducted his music as much as possible. And incidentally, we're recording all of his symphonies. All nine? Oh, yes. Ten. Ten now? Yes, yes, oh, because well, he's, written a, date. he's written a tenth and he's written it for me. So I'm very flattered. <sighs> I shall be premiering the Tenth Symphony with the Liverpool Orchestra uh, in January, and we're going to record it. Vernon Hantley, thank you very much indeed, and all strength to your elbow. Thank you so much. The conductor of Vernon Handley was talking to Michael Hall.